Good afternoon and welcome to a year active debate where we'll be discussing the role of food supplements in improving health in the EU. I'm Om Zaidi and I'll be your host for what will be a really fascinating and an insightful debate. A big thank you to everyone who is joining us online and a reminder, if you have any questions or comments, don't forget to send them into our chat page. I can't see any at the moment, so please do send them in along with the name of the panelists that your question or comment is directed to. And we'll pick out some of them for later on in the program, so do get involved. Okay, so to the topic of the debate, supplements. Now, just have a think about the supplement mix lurking in your cupboards for yourself or your family. What nutritional value are they really adding to your diet? Do they boost any dietary deficiencies, perhaps? How much of an impact did the COVID-19 pandemic have? And was boosting immunity a factor in the kind of supplement mix that you currently are using? So there are loads of supplements, of course, out there from pills to capsules, tablets, liquids and powders. And nowadays, um, there's something really for everyone from natural, organic to even plant based products. But are we really getting the right nutrients we need for our age, our health and our lifestyle, especially in an aging population? Well, the European nutrition and supplements market was valued at over 55 billion euros in 2021, and it's expected to grow by 5 percent over this decade. But here's a question. If so many of us are taking supplements, why aren't our health providers and our governments getting involved? And so with that, it's time to then debate. Are the supplements we take good, bad or ugly? Well, let's ask our experts. OK, well, just a reminder, of course, that today's debate isn't about rules and regulations uh, that, that, of course, are in place. This is really about the culture around supplements and the role of policy. So let me introduce um, who our panelists are. We have Sara Serdas, Socialist Member of the European Parliament and a former doctor. We have Curly At, Member of Diversity Europe, uh, the European Economic and Social Committee and Director of the Estonian Farmers Federation. We also have Philip Calder, President of the Federation of European Nutrition Societies and Professor of Nutritional Immunology at the Faculty of Medicine at the University of Southampton. And then we also have Bernard Haber, uh, board member at Food Supplements uh, Europe. Sorry, Bernd Haber. My apologies for getting your name wrong there. Okay, well, to understand who all of our panelists are, um, and what sort of level of expertise they have and what they want to bring to this debate. They're now going to be given a few minutes um, to talk to everyone. So going in the order um, of introduction, I first of all invite MEP Sara Serdas to take the floor for a few minutes. Please go ahead. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, actually. And uh, thank you for uh, having me here and for organizing uh, this event that will tackle into the much challenged debate uh, from a very wide and hot topic. Uh, food supplements, as we know, are not homogeneous. Uh, it's not an homogeneous reality across member states in the EU. As we have uh, different terms being used, there's different definitions different regulatory agencies and different perspectives across uh, professionals and consumers. So this conversation on the table is key actually on contributing to the minimization of misinformation, translate a bit of evidence for, from paper to practice, and the, the need also to discuss uh, policy making around food supplements. So I won't take very long on this initial uh, statement, but I hope we can integrate these different perspectives without ever losing a, a touch with what the latest evidence, what science indeed has to tell us about all these uh, substances. Okay, thank you. Uh, MP Sarah Serdas. Okay, next to Curly Atz, please, from Diversity Europe. Please take the floor for a few minutes. From Estonia, uh, and I firstly I would like to thank you as well for invite invitation to this um, event. Um, and I am uh, representing farmers in a daily basis. Uh, today's topic is not something that I'm work working with every day, but food is my passion, and that's why today's topic is important to me. Also, I took part of the European Economic and Social Committee opinion study group for how to implement harmonization of market entry for food supplements in the EU solution and best practices. Coming to today's topics, uh, the food supplement market is growing in Europe, showing an increased consumer interest. 
food supplements are regulated by Directive 2002-46-EC, which is not applied uniformly across the EU. However, if the EU internal market is to function properly, it is essential for the legislation to be applied in a uniform way to enable safe products to circulate freely and unsafe products to be withdrawn from the market. The European Economic and Social Committee advocates revising this legislation, in particular by updating the definition of the food supplements, including a requirements of notification and scrutiny of a new products to be placed on the market and setting up a food monitoring system that collects adverse reaction, thereby increasing protection of public health. Products and ingredients safety must be the top requirements and should there be determined as a scientific basis. The information provided to consumers must be enable them to consume the product safety and the European and Economic Social Committee recommends that communication and consumer education measures be put in place, particularly for e-commerce. The European and Economic and Social Committee encourages the authorities to step up monitoring testing and surveillance of products in order to protect consumers by ordering non-compliant products to be withdrawn. This monitoring should also prevent unfair competitions. The European Economic Social Committee believes that this topic fits well with the World Health Organization One Health approach and the EU Farm to Fork strategy, which calls for healthy, sustainable diets and better consumption information while ensuring fair trade between operators. The European Economic and Social Committee considers that healthy and sustainable diets represent a key pillar of comprehensive EU food policy, as we urgently need to orient our diets to improve, not damage the health of the both ecosystems and the public. There is a widespread knowledge that this is a good to consume food supplements in addition to food to maintain and promote health they can be used to supply the body with the nutrients it needs to reduce the risk of getting sick. But we must keep in mind that food supplements are not substitute for balanced, complete and healthy diets. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks for also pointing that last bit out that, of course, we do need to all have a healthy and balanced diet that we can't just rely on magic pills as such. Um, Dr. Philip Calder, please go next. Yeah, thanks very much. Hi, everybody. So I'm, I'm an academic, I work in a university and I do research on the relationship between nutrition and health. So I'm really interested in uh, today's discussion and debate. So many nutrients are essential to support normal bodily functions. And of course, all parts of the body need to be supplied with an optimal nutrient mix from our immune system to our brain, to our heart. When we think in nutritional terms, this word essentiality actually means nutrients that we have to get from the diet. These are nutrients that we can't make ourselves. That obviously includes all of the minerals, but it also includes many of the vitamins, although not all of the vitamins. But I think also there are some nutrients which may not be classically essential, but which our bodies find really difficult to make enough of. Vitamin D would be a good example. The omega-3 fatty acids would be another good example. Now, we know that a deficiency in all of these sorts of nutrients, minerals, vitamins, omega-3s, leads to disease. But we can have a gray area between sufficient intake and deficient intake. So that would be subclinical deficiency or inadequacy. And we know that inadequacy is linked to impaired function. For example, impaired immune function, impaired cognitive function, impaired physical function. A good example of this would be people who have a subclinical iron deficiency uh, find it easy, uh, find it difficult to, uh, to get about, they find it difficult to breathe, and so on. They get fatigued easily. Of course, these subclinical deficiencies not only impair function, but they also actually increase disease risk. Now, recognizing all of these properties of micronutrients so minerals, vitamins, but also omega-3s, EFSA permits health claims, dozens of health claims on vitamins, minerals, and some health claims on omega-3s. 
So these are really good for us. And of course, we should get them from our diet, as we just heard. But if we look across Europe, we find many people have lower than recommended intakes of these uh, of many of these nutrients, and therefore they have lower than desirable amounts of these nutrients in their bloodstream and in their body. So good examples of this would be vitamin D and vitamin E, folate, iodine, selenium, uh, iron, particularly in some subgroups of the population, and the omega-3s that I mentioned before. So put simply, many Europeans are not are just not getting enough of these nutrients from the diet. As an example, there's quite good data that in Germany, for example, but also in Switzerland, and in fact, probably in all European countries, at least 75% of the adult population is consuming less than the reference value. So that's the amount, the minimum amount they should be consuming of vitamin D and of folate. And of course, this story goes on across different countries for different nutrients. This happens across the life course. So uh, these low intakes are found in children, they're found in adolescents, they're found in older people, as well, of course, in, as middle and middle-aged people. Um, I'd like to echo the previous comment that it would be most desirable for people to get the amounts of the nutrients they need from foods, um, but we're here today to discuss what might happen when it's not possible for people to do that and where the supplements can make up this essential nutrient gap. Thanks very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kelder. And it was interesting there that you um, mentioned vitamin D. I mean, I've, as we've all sort of noticed a lot more um, post-pandemic, there's and during the pandemic, there was a big trend for people um, taking the supplements of vitamin D. So that's something I will touch upon later. But over now to Bernd Harbour, uh, board member of the Food Supplement Europe. Please go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. And good afternoon to everybody, to the panel, and also the guests in, in the in the conference. Yeah, it's now 20 years since the Food Supplements Directive has been adopted and our association, Food Supplements Europe, believes it's now the right time to have a serious discussion about the potential of the role of food supplements in nutrition and health policy. And I, we highly appreciate that this conference is today about the policy. Why is this discussion important now from our perspective? The pandemic has highlighted that we have an inadequate nutritional status of too many people in the European population and Professor Calder just uh, mentioned that this is uh, shown also by in, for different nutrients in, in, uh, in, in the different nutritional surveys that are available. While we fully support the continuing drive to encourage people to consume a balanced diet, and that's absolutely clear, and so we are also supportive on that, we are aware that in practice this seems to be really difficult to achieve for too many people. If we want the European population to be healthy and resilient, there is a need to look at additional ways to address the gaps. And this includes, of course, also food supplementation. Let me give you one example, and it was already mentioned by Professor Calder, vitamin D. Because it's such a good example, vitamin D is an essential micronutrient with a lot of functions for the human body. The vitamin is best known for its benefits on healthy bones, and we all know this also from because it's, it's clear signs. Falls are the second most common cause of unintentional injury deaths worldwide. There are many studies that show clearly that vitamin D supplementation can reduce the risk of falling in elderly population especially and avoid the resulting costs to the healthcare services and the personal miseries of the people to so many uh, people that are affected. This role has been recognized by different bodies like the European Food Safety Authority, but it's also included in the World Health Organization policy. With all the signs behind, we are wondering why is the intake of vitamin D through supplementation not more recognized and promoted in nutrition policy in the European Union, but also in the member states, especially if we take into account that many parts of the population suffer from this important vitamin, as mentioned also by Professor Calder. These are the types of issues that need serious discussion today among those involved in developing policy in the European Union. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ben Harper there. Um, okay, well, let's um, kick off the debate then. Um, let's first of all go to our MEP, Sarah Serbas. Um, a sort of more general question. Um, critics would say, I mean, all of you, uh, you know, you've spoken very positively about the role that supplements can play, especially with creating this balanced diet. Um, but critics would say, 
and apologize for my language here, um, that supplements are just expensive urine. What would you make of that? Um, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's uh, quite an interesting uh, ex exclamation. However, as it has been stated before, not all supplements are the same. Uh, some supplements are indeed clinically used to mitigate malnutrition in hospital settings or in different clinical settings, uh, in deficiency situations, and uh, others are used in elite sports as a supplement, for instance, betalanine and caffeine. However, uh, one common mistake one might have is to talk about supplements as if they are all the same and this, as if they fit one only box. Um, indeed, some will be <laughs> very expensive urine, and this will happen if they are not recommended by an accredited health professional um, that has um, extensive education on these regards and how to use it and how to recommend its usage. If their use is not appropriate for the situation of the individual, and in this case, more specifically, the clinical situation, for instance, uh, we, we spoke about vitamin D. This is a supplement that is uh, quite recommended up in the north of Europe. However, where I come from in Madeira, Portugal, we don't intake that extra supplement in the, our diet. And also it will be expensive here, and sorry to keep using your, your uh, affirmation, if they are used without any evidence base, without any evidence of clinical and performance benefits, and as we call it a bit of a fat snake in the sense that they don't have any added value, but they are very much commercialized as uh, having these miraculous responses. Okay, well, let's pick up on that then. Um, Bernd Harper, um, you know, as the sort of the board member of the Food Supplements Europe then, um, how do, or if, if, for example, people are watching online, um, lots of people, you know, take lots of many supplements, but how do you then essentially spot the fakes or the cowboys? What should people be looking for when they're deciding they're going to a shop or they're, or, or they're shopping online and deciding I need to take XYZ supplements? Thank you for this question. I, I think our latest research shows, shows that the, most of the European citizens are primarily using supplements for a simple reason. I think they want to maintain their overall health. Also, maybe also maybe a little bit driven by by the the pandemic. So therefore, this is this is the core principle, and it shows that the consumer have a good understanding of the role of supplementation because it supports their general well being at the at the end. As more and more science uh, will come up uh, about the role of adequate and optimal nutritional uh, nutrition emerges, we expect increasing numbers of consumers to consider supplementation as a way to close these nutrient gaps we have discussed before and maintain their general health. Okay, um, so EU citizens then, as you're saying, they have a good general understanding um, of the supplements. Um, so Dr. Philip Calder then, um, People have a good understanding of supplements. They also have cupboards full. Um, and as you know, you were saying in your opening statement, um, you were talking about vitamin D. Um, so we saw this sort of trend during the pandemic, especially of people wanting to, you know, as they were sort of essentially not able to really go to many places or they were stuck indoors, lots of people taking vitamin D, vitamin C, stuff like that. So as our sort of expert in micronutrients, what supplements would you say generally people of perhaps different age categories should be taking as a sort of bare minimum, if there is such a thing? Yeah. So, so um, I think um, we all agree that, you know, diet first is, is the default, but we all also agree that there are these micronutrient or essential nutrient gaps. We all, all have mentioned vitamin D because I think it's the one that's most clearly demonstrated to be um, uh, taken in at levels way below what, what's recommended. And actually, coming back to your point about the pandemic, here in the UK, the UK government during the early days of the first lockdown was actually um, very clear that people should actually 
uh, take a vitamin D supplement at, at the recommended level of 15 micrograms per day, and that, that applied to all of the population. So they did they did recognize this, that people would be spending probably more time indoors, and therefore that was something to consider. So I think vitamin D is something a lot of people might want to think about. Um, I've mentioned the omega-3 fatty acids, which, again, unless people are eating oily fish regularly, they're probably not getting enough of. Um, but there are lots of other um, good examples as well. So um, iron, uh, particularly in uh, young and middle-aged women, iron is, is an issue. Um, selenium is an issue in a lot of Europe because the soils in which uh, wheat is grown uh, are poor in selenium. Selenium is not often talked about, but that is that is a problem. Uh, folate in many countries. I mentioned Germany. I think less than uh, more than seventy five percent of adults are not getting enough folate. So I'm just throwing these different vitamins and minerals out there to give a picture that we can't really. I mean, I think vitamin D is unique in some ways. Omega threes is un is unique in another way. But beyond that, I, it's difficult to really pick out one. There's actually a whole lot. And personally, if people want to think about a supplement, I would myself um, feel it, it's reasonable for them to use a, a multiple micronutrient supplement that's providing something like the RDA amounts. Um, and I would advise against, you know, high dose single uh, uh, nutrient supplements. I think that's not wise for uh, people generally. Okay, good to also mention that, but high dosing, because I know that some people sometimes do try to do that. Uh, so Kelly Atz then, has or have you noticed then that the market or trends have changed because of the pandemic when it comes to supplements? Well, um, as mentioned previously about the vitamin D, um, well, in Estonia, coming from uh, northern countries, vitamin D is actually very uh, recommended in our um, menus uh, during the winter time, for regardless of how old or how young you are. But uh, yes, COVID nineteen, um, there was a very high recommendation from our uh, uh, doctors that we need to uh, eat vitamin C, uh, which is uh, very good for common cold. And uh, that that we saw that a lot of people were buying and uh, and uh, eating vitamin C to a little bit uh, try to get away from the COVID uh, pandemic and uh, not to infect in this uh, kind of uh, uh, disease. Okay. Well, we're hearing then fr from, from yourself, um, that you know, vitamin D is recommended in Estonia. It's also, I mean, obviously during the pandemic, it was also recommended in the UK. Um, MEP Sarah said this then. Um, if we say, if just for argument's sake, if we say that most people generally do take supplements, then why would you say, apart from, for example, vitamin D, why do GPs, health practic practitioners, generally not advise us on what to take when it comes to, to supplements? Because for a lot of people, they probably would would expect that that would be something quite natural um, for their GP or health practic practic practitioner to do. I, I would say the, the response here is quite simple because I cannot speak for GPs and health prof uh, practitioners uh, worldwide. But uh, the main um, message in regards to uh, food and diet is to have a diversified and complete diet. And with that, even though you can have uh, different parts of the globe where you don't have the necessary intake, with a, a diverse and complete diet, you will have the necessary intake of the nutrients, macro, micronutrients, vitamins that you need for your homeostasis, meaning for your balanced physiological uh, state. However, uh, let's say that uh, uh, GPs uh, can in, and, and do provide um, advice on this, but for specific clinical uh, questions. And one must differentiate because GPs are not telling us to go uh, to a supplement food store, as we have a lot here in Portugal, because they try to send us to the fruit and vegetable stands because those uh, 
the the, the uh, food that we have at our disposal in the supermarkets in the markets have all the intakes that we need however there's specific clinical conditions where you need that extra supplement and for specific um, uh, um, details also for instance if you're an athlete uh, athlete or if you have a deficiency of some sort as the previous speaker already stated so I would like to refer a bit to the best available evidence, which is with a complete and diverse diet, you would have the intake needed for your well-being and your stasis, in a sense. Sure. Um, okay, so follow up with Bent Harbour then. Um, is, I mean, in your opinion then, is there a lack of trust from the medical community of supplements, even though, of course, they are regulated as food? I don't think so. I don't, I don't think so. And I also think that also current research suggests that the opposite is right, that they also think about what uh, are the current uh, needs of, of my patients and of my, 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 yeah, my patients that are in my, in my practice. And uh, what, 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 we, what we see is really that uh, there is more discussion on, on nutrition and what are the needs of the people. And I think what is also quite important is that uh, uh, I think there's better diagnosis now, better diagnosis on the nutrients in the blood level so that you have a better understanding about the situation of the people to identify the gaps. And therefore, food supplements can be, are already recommended by the physicians, by the doctors and health practitioners. And so therefore, I think this is uh, the situation which is changing. There are specific recommendations. Okay, good to hear. Um, and Philip Calder, how do you want to follow up as well? Yeah, so I think some of this depends a little bit on on the cultural setting. So I'm pretty sure that some um, doctors uh, in some countries um, are more likely to consider this an important issue and maybe to advise patients or even recommend them. I think in other countries, the doctors, uh, the medical community is very much driven by the evidence base and the recommendations. So one example would be um, before pregnancy and early in pregnancy, women should have an increased intake of folate, which they can only get from supplements actually at the levels that are recommended. And in countries where that is a recommendation, you know, doctors reinforce that. Um, and, you know, others who deal with pregnant women reinforce that. So where it's part actually of a, of a recommendation or a guideline, they do do it. And I think an issue is a lot of the things we're talking about are not really part of, um, okay, there are dietary recommendations, but they're general, they're for everybody. They're not specific recommendations for groups of people, and therefore the medical community uh, don't engage with it. Again, vitamin D, particularly in older people, uh, is a bit different, and I'm, I think many GPs uh, will recommend to older people um, you know, supplements of vitamin D and calcium, particularly older women. So I think it's all about how they see um, the supplement as being sort of almost medicalized. If it's medicalized, they will go with it. If it's not, it's something that maybe they shy away from a little. That's my impression anyway. And, uh, and Dr. Calder, can you give perhaps a specific um, case study or example um, of someone who had real deficiencies and how supplements really did help them? <laughs> yeah, so, so um, the, I mean, we have to go back in history. And, and at one stage in medicine, um, the, the subject we're talking about was one of the hottest areas in medicine. And that was because there were people in all parts of the world who had diseases that were very common that actually related to pre precisely to, uh, to um, deficiencies, particularly of vitamins. So vitamin deficiency diseases. I mean, everyone knows about scurvy and vitamin C, but beriberi is another one which was very common. And, you know, that was found to be um, a thiamine deficiency. And... Um, so, you know, um, the discovery of the importance of vitamins actually relates to these deficiencies in um, the 19th and early 20th centuries. Now, what we're talking about, I think, today is not frank deficiency, uh, except maybe for vitamin D, but this gray area of insufficiency where people are getting some of these micronutrients, but not as much as they need. 
Um, so they're not showing frank acute disease, but they have impaired function of one sort or another. It may be only slightly impaired, but over time, this increases disease risk. And Kelly Atz, would you like to comment then? Uh, yes, I would like to maybe wider the topic that uh, I totally agree with previous speakers, but because of the, our modern lifestyle, not everyone uh, managed to eat a healthy diet. But for example, in Estonia, uh, we have uh, over 12,000 registered uh, food supplements. 12,000, it's a lot. And a yearly basis, there is uh, plus eight till 900 uh, supplements uh, going into our agriculture and um, and uh, food um, agency. So uh, this is something that people can, because they're considered as food, you can go and buy a food supplement in a, in a food store. And there is, ev you can find for everything that you think that you would need, whatever there is in the market so i think that is uh, something that uh, that is uh, concerning that there is a lot of uh, food supplements that is not recommended by a medical worker uh, which should be and there is a wide range of different food supplements that you can actually buy from the grocery stores that maybe you even don't need and you don't know because you're not a medical you don't have a medical education that if you're if it's okay to take this with other medic medicals that medi medicines that uh, maybe your doctor prescribed you so i think that um, today's situation for example in estonia the all the responsibility uh, lies with the consumer and that's why i think that it's very very important today's topic that we need to little bit look over this uh, policy framework how to control and um, supervise better uh, the market entries for su uh, food supplements okay well let's 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 talk about policy then i mean especially given that you say the problem with supplements that they are so widely available and you literally can get them absolutely anywhere now um so where is government policy right now when it comes to supplements and would you say eu member states are perhaps a little bit conservative and perhaps we can go to our mep yeah, what we have at the moment is that we have a lot of uh, supplements that are regulated as uh, food and by the food agencies, and but they will have, uh, if in taken in certain amounts, and for instance, I give you the example of green tea. Green tea has a substance that is uh, hypocoagulant, and if you're taking um, clinically an hypocoagulant, and if you take high doses of uh, uh, extract of uh, green tea, that will, can have interaction. So uh, food supplements can usually have interactions with the medicines you usually take. However, this is regulated by two different agencies. With the medicines agency, is very much um, studied how you, that substance uh, reflects in your body, the side effects and so on. However, the other substance, as the previous speaker was saying, it's very much available in the grocery store and sometimes is both without a health professional's advice. And here I would like to raise again this point. It needs to be guided, if not by your GP or a medical doctor, by a nutritionist because they are the ones mostly in place and have studied how these supplements will affect your uh, physiology. Also, this is a very gray area, again, because it's regulated by two different agencies and the food uh, part is not as regulated as the medicines. Um, and this is something that we need to work more and we need to ask more because this is a systemic uh, problem that needs systemic answers. And uh, a, a supplement will only help you if you need it and if the dosage is adequate to your body. Now, uh, does an, a citizen in a grocery store has the uh, ability to understand uh, how much to intake and for why? And this is a response that needs to be uh, given by better regulation of these products and not only seeing them as food supplements and as food, but also as something that will interact with your homeostasis. So, Ben Harbour, um, just to pick up on the point there, um, why is regulation of supplements such a grey area, do you think? Is it because 
governments or they're trying, you know, people are trying to find perhaps short-term solutions. They think that, you know, one pill will solve all of their problems and they're not really trying to, they're thinking that this one supplement or few supplements will really help to address their health concerns or health problems. And they're not really addressing the real issue, which is to have a proper balanced diet. I don't think that the consumer has a poor understanding of the role of food supplements. And I think this is it's, uh, really for most of the consumers, it's, it's that they want to maintain their overall health, as I mentioned beforehand. And so therefore, they're looking really specifically what they, what, what they need. And uh, it's, it's not like that they're going to the supermarket and buying the stuff without any, any thinking. And they, I think they have informed themselves beforehand that they can make the, 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 the well is um, uh, 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 well, a good choice. Um, I, I think it's it's vital, and uh, we have heard that beforehand from the other speakers to protect the, our our the consumers, uh, and that safety is of course the highest priority. But the evidence suggests that the consumers are very engaged in terms of finding the information. They need to make informed choices. So therefore, they can even do these informed choices in a supermarket or a grocery store. We don't see the evidence that consumers think a supplement will solve their pro all their problems and provide a short-term fix of, of, a, of, of, uh, of, of their health issue, maybe. They use uh, them really, as I said before, to maintain overall health. Um, if I'm looking to this topic of gray area, uh, of course, historically, governments have have always taken into account the value of supplementation when setting health policy. However, there are signs that this can be changing. And as, as understanding of science of nutrition increases, this could be a good situation. And I think it was mentioned beforehand by Professor Calder. In Switzerland, for example, the government has really issued now advices for people aged 65 and older to, to use daily food supplementation of vitamin D. Also, the UK government recently announced that they want to have a public consultation on vitamin D. And we also know that Finland is already for many, many years uh, recommending for certain age groups vitamin D as supplementation. So therefore, there are recommendations already there. It's not only a gray uh, area for governments, at least on the national level it's improving, uh, but uh, we still are not there where we should be in the future. Okay, so Philip Calder then, um, what could we be doing better when it comes to supplements? Yeah, yeah. so I just want to go back to a really important point that Sarah raised when she talked about green tea. So, so, so far we've mainly been discussing vitamins and minerals, and vitamins and minerals have very well-defined physiological actions and there are dietary recommendations for all of the common vitamins and minerals in most countries. What that means is we know something about what the level of intake should be for optimal health. <clears throat> now, Sarah brought up green tea, and of course, that's an example of another type of supplement. And we know very little about the physiological actions of uh, many of those, let's call them extracts of, of uh, plants of one sort or another. And there are no uh, recommended intakes for any of those. So they are actually an even grayer area than the vitamins and minerals. So that's the point I particularly wanted to make at this stage that, um, you know, although they're all supplements, uh, there are supplements that come with uh, different levels of um uh, scientific understandings, let's say. Now, in uh, giving my answer, I've forgotten the question that you posed to me at, at the start there. Sorry. No worries. Well, how about um, I ask you then directly um, a question from the audience. Um, it was actually a little bit more to do with what Harbour was talking about. Um, but Professor Cordy, you perhaps go ahead. Um, so Git and I can't pronounce your surname, so I'll leave it there. Um, but he says, does everyone have a nutritional education to make an educated choice for his or her individual needs? Does anyone, does anybody ask a doctor about what he or she has to eat and says, isn't nutrition a personal choice as long as foods are safe? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. And in fact, that's one of the answers to the question that maybe you did ask me, which is about governmental interventions in this area. Because I think, you know, it's a fine line. What, what people choose to eat is, 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 their, uh, is their right to choose. 
but we, I think, uh, and governments would want them to make healthy choices. Um, so I don't think the question is about what do individuals know. And I think, you know, a lot of people don't um, actually understand the relationship between what they eat, um, how their body functions and their disease risk. And we we're, we're re really have become aware of this actually in a trial we've been doing, which was a weight loss trial and people with obesity, where it was quite um, astounding that a lot of people cannot make a relationship between what they eat and, you know, what is happening in their bodies. So I think there are people who have low levels of education in this area, uh, yet there, of course, are people who follow uh, these things daily and, you know, are almost as expert as, as the academics. So it's a continuum, I think. And again, as with the recommendations, which are numbers for, you know, a number for everyone out there, which is obviously not right because people have different rec different requirements. Um, I think, again, we have this breadth of knowledge and understanding. And it's really hard, I think, for a general practitioner, for example, to to deal with that. And I, uh, one of the, the colleagues here in the panel raised, I think it was Sarah again, raised the importance of nutritionists or dietitians in all of this. And they play a really important role in terms of um, personally analyzing people's diets and giving them uh, personalized advice based upon what they're eating now. And, you know, that would be for dietary change. It might include the need for particular supplements. So, Sarah, uh, um, just, just picking up on what Professor Calder was saying there about the role of nutritionists. Um, for people that are perhaps a little bit, they don't quite understand what they should be doing for their for their own nutrition, should they be seeing nutritionists or do you think people can be their own nutritionists with the right information? That would happen ideally if we would work very hard on better health information and more literacy on these regards. Uh, in what concerns food supplements, as uh, the colleague was say stating, there's more than 12,000 regulated uh, or, or uh, registered in Estonia. Uh, I don't. I don't have the numbers in Portugal. So, what I would like to say, it's it's such a, a wide field that it's really hard for one to reiterate itself into taking their own choices, conscious choices. So, my recommendation, as also as a health professional, as a medical doctor, would be for these questions to go to a certified nutritionist and dietitian. However, allow me to state here a bit on accessibility to care, and this also. It relates to the fact that some people might look at these supplements as a miracle cure or as a way to, for instance, um, lose weight or have better performances. This should should uh, be provided and this accessibility should be affordable. Otherwise, people will take their own choices, sometimes not the best evidence space, and this will lead um, sometimes to quite catastrophic results. I would like to recall that a few years ago we had some cases of liver failure because some, some people in a gym in Portugal were, were abusing these uh, food supplements and this led to severe consequences to one's health. So my advice would be to always have a guidance of a health professional and if possible a dietitian and nutritionist and if this can be provided by the primary healthcare services that would be um, uh, really great in order to improve accessibility to care for all. Okay, and so Kelly Atz then, um, do you think governments are doing enough when it comes to information sharing, when it comes to um, the nutritional value of supplements? Well, I can speak uh, mostly about Estonia. I think that uh, uh, that uh, our system right now is uh, it's it's very easy to to put on a market a new supplement, and I think that uh, this is uh, an issue that has been raised uh, in Estonia, and uh, I hope uh, that uh, they are doing more. <clears throat> because it's very 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 important uh, to uh, to have the safety. 
products for, or safety uh, food supplements for uh, the consumers. And uh, as Sarah previously said, I think that it's very, very important that, uh, that uh, the people who want to or they think that they need something uh, extra for their health, they, they consult with uh, their nutrition or dietitian or their, their doctor so that they can have the recommendation. Because I agree that people have different knowledge about their food supplements. Uh, some people are very, very knowledgeable how to, what they need and how to eat. And they, they look up and uh, read about the different food supplements. But there is another, uh, another group of people who don't have the information. And I think that, uh, that there, there is much that government can do as well to, to inform uh, to inform uh, consumers and uh, for example in Estonia um, uh, the Estonian agriculture ministry just uh, a few days back uh, um, had an article about food supplements and what we should um, uh, notice if we are buying a food supplement what we should look uh, look there and how to uh, how to consume there and that that I think that uh, the governments can do more and uh, as I said previously, I think that, that there is very important that, that the authorities step up to monitor, test and su surveillance of products in order to protect consumers by ordering non-compliant products to be withdrawn. Okay, so governments could do more, they could step up. So Bent Harbour then, given the high demand, of course, for supplements um, that we're seeing all across Europe, should policy be responding in kind? Yeah, uh, and I, I want to turn this around to, to the opportunity which you can get from, from food supplementation. And uh, I hear a lot of about concerns about risk and, and interaction with pharmaceuticals and so on. That That's true. And we have also to look on, on this, these cases and how we, we can uh, regulate that. On, on the other side, uh, we have also to see the opportunities by, uh, by, by food supplements and by a better intake of, of food supplementation, especially for those people that need these, these nutrients uh, because they have the, the gaps. And if you're looking then from a policy, policy perspective on, on the whole situation, if you're getting the benefits of a better nutrition, of a better nutrient intake, you can of course maybe then also look on, on this topic, what I mentioned in my first statement, that we can work on on the on the health healthcare costs because they they are steadily increasing and they are a pressure for 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 the member states that they have so high healthcare costs in in, in in the different countries and so therefore if we can improve the nutrition uh, by a balanced diet but also closing the gaps by a, a smart choice of of uh, with, with food supplements. And here I, I'm really supportive to, on, on the, the, the topics mentioned beforehand, that health practitioners, nutritionists are playing an essential role, that we are choosing the right supplements. Then we can, of course, uh, uh, really reduce this risk for, for health and also improving the situation on the healthcare costs. Okay, so, so, that's then. so what should be in the toolbox, you could say, for individual countries or member states when it comes to really directing people in the right way when it comes to food supplements? Yeah, uh, so it, it should be a quite comprehensive toolbox and one that uh, mimics a bit what is done for other uh, public health uh, scenarios, which is uh, better literacy and uh, uh, tools needed in order for them to take the healthier choices for themselves. However, this needs to go hand in hand with better regulation. We cannot, must not forget that. And also, and uh, drawing a bit in, into my la latest intervention, uh, to better accessibility to care. So this is a very quite a holistic approach. I know it's quite demanding and perhaps there's not um, much resources for that, but one needs to take um, the idea that we need to uh, provide better importance to our diets. After all, they are the fuel of our bodies. And if we have a good fuel, we're going to live uh, healthier and better lives for sure. For sure. Um, and talking about living healthier lives, uh, Dr. Philip Calder, there is a question um, from one of our viewers. It's not directed towards you, but I think you might be the best person to help because um, I think they are talking from their own personal experience. Um, these dolls said he's put them in priority and he's asked, where would you act first? One, stop smoking. 
stop allowing alcohol. Uh, three, provide better advice on a healthy diets. Four, provide better opportunities to communicate info supplements. Uh, five, stop using commonly traditionally used food supplements. So I think what this person is trying to say is, <laughs> where should they start? Yeah, so um, I mean, I think the this is a bit of a rhetorical question. So, so all of the things that are listed are important. Um, I think it's it's quite clear that um, cessation of smoking and getting alcohol consumption uh, under control um, are really important um, because of the clear short and long-term consequences of both of those things. Um, but I think poor diet does have medium and long-term health consequences um, and long-lasting consequences. So, you know, I, I would put getting diet in order, um, you know, I'd have to rank at three, if I'm honest, after the other two. Um, but, but um you know, managing diet is a little bit different, I think, because we all, everyone has to eat. You know, we can't survive without eating for very long. So everyone has to eat. Um, but we don't have to smoke cigarettes and we don't have to consume alcohol. So I think that's a differential I would make. I would put them actually in different uh, lifestyle categories. Um, my own view, which I said right at the beginning, is like most governments, I would prefer that people took control of their nutrient intake through um, a healthy, diverse, well-balanced diet, and other people have said that. So I would have to put getting diet in order ahead of the use of supplements. Um, but I do recognize that even people with quite good diets can have um, micronutrient gaps, including vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids, um, unless they're eating a lot of oily fish. So I think that's the way I would sort of do do that ranking. It's a, I've never been asked that question before. It's a really good question. Well, I'm, I'm glad someone did ask that. Uh, but Bent Harbour then, um, it is a quite interesting question from Catherine McBride, and she says, who tests the supplements that actually... Who tests that supplements actually contain the things they claim to contain? Is there an EU agency responsible or is it a national uh, competence? Oh, yeah. Thank, thank you for this question. That's a very good one. Of course, the, 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 uh, the food supplements producer are first testing their, their, their products in the quality release of the products, that the content that is inside, uh, that is also labeled uh, for a certain nutrient on the food supplement, that it is also fulfilling the requirements as it is labeled, also the tolerances and so on. But also looking on the quality side, uh, that there are no contaminants inside or other things that have to be controlled, that the product is really safe. So that's the first step. So that's the quality approach. Then, of course, there are national uh, national authorities that are uh, making uh, the surveillance and looking to the products in the market, and therefore they controlling them in the market if the products that are in the market, based on the composition and the labeling, are in line with the laws. Okay, um, Kelly Atz, how about this question um, for you to take from Gert? and I'll leave it at his second name. Um, he says, why should we differently look to food supplements than to regular foods? What is basically the proven risk of food supplements in comparison to regular foods? I think that's quite an interesting take. Yes, it's a very, very interesting take. Um, and I think I'm not the right person to answer it because I, uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm not... Uh, it's so expert, but uh, my own opinion, I think that uh, we can't take them or look them differently. I think that food quality is very important, what quality food we eat. And I think that's, um, that's uh, to start. Um, and, that's, and then uh, the quality of the food supplements, I think that that is very important as well. Uh, as I previously said, there is a lot he of was different- He saying that. I think what, 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 what really, you know, I understand you say that maybe it's not your sort of real, real competence, but I think what he's essentially saying here is should regular food and supplements be on the same sort of standing? Is there an argument for them both being on the same sort of platform? Because both are providing nutrients. For sure. But I think that uh, if we're taking it that way, that uh, the food 
uh, is more, you can't uh, just uh, eat uh, food supplements and uh, stay alive. I think that this is something that uh, you, you need to do. You need to eat food. And uh, when the food is not giving you or your diet is not uh, um, balanced, uh, healthy, um, and you, you can't get all the um, essential nutritions, then you, you should take uh, supple supplements to, uh, to, to be a full healthy diet. As said previously, in Nordic countries, uh, D vitamin, vitamin is very essential for for our winter time and it's not only for for older or younger people it's all the population need to eat d vitamins and um and etc so i think that um you can't put them on the same level because they're not the same no they're really not the same um would anyone else in the panel like to take that one over perhaps philip uh dr philip calder yeah, I think, again, it's an interesting and provocative question. Um, so supplements are exactly what the word is, which is that to supplement what is missing from uh, a, a, the normally consumed diet. I think that's a way to look at it. And actually, if um, we got everything we needed from the food we ate, we wouldn't need supplements at all. Now, we've all said that actually doesn't happen. So you know, that's just a hypothetical thing. But I, I, I see foods and supplements as being two separate categories. And I think the point that you can't live on supplements alone um, is a good one, uh, partly because they don't provide you with any of the energy yielding substrates that the body needs. Um, coming back to another point that I think was made and then sort of skipped over, which is, you know, diets can be unhealthy and they do pose a health risk. Um, they can pose a health risk in the long term. So, you know, a diet could be more or less healthy. So um, not everything about diet is, is necessarily a good thing. Um, and I think one of the worries of, we've touched on, you know, um, the conservatism of governments around the area of supplements, is they might have a concern that um, endorsing supplements could make at least some people think I can eat what I like and I can make up for that by taking some supplements. And I don't think that is, well, I don't think that's right, but that wouldn't be a very good mindset for the population. I mean, I don't know whether some of the others want to comment on, on that view. No, please do. Who would like to take it? Yeah, maybe, maybe a short comment. And and you mentioned, Mariam, also about the toolbox we, we have. I, I think the fundamental principle is really the, the balanced diet. And I think we all agree on, on, on that here. But in certain situations, of course, there could be other measures where, where um, you have to see how you can get the blue nutrients to the population. And therefore, maybe as an example, we have already mentioned the Nordic countries. Finland is a good example because they have started very early with food fortification programs and vitamin D already in 2003 because they have seen that there is a gap in their population. But the interesting point is they also saw after a few years of refuge that they are not reaching all of their uh, population subgroups. So therefore, they, they looked after a few years on the data and said, okay, we still need other other measures to, to reach our population. And supplementation was then recommended for certain subpopulations. So therefore, at the end, you have a toolbox of different measures to reach really an optimal nutrition at the end to, to have a better health for the future. Okay, um, I'm going to try to run through a few more of the questions um, from our audience. Um, there's a question for um, MEP Cerdas. Um, Alexandria says, I would like to ask whether there's any news on the authorization of CBD in novel foods. Um, she says she recalls it was supposed to be authorized by the 8th of March. <laughs> I actually do not have any news on the... Uh, authorization of CBD in regards that I'm not um, into that file. So uh, my recommendation would be to um, check with the commission uh, how it, what is the follow up with that regulation. But would However, you say, I am. What, but what, what would your opinion then be on CBD? I mean, obviously, there's an explosion if you go into any health food sto shop nowadays, and I'm sure um, other shops as well, there's an absolute explosion of CBD products. So are yeah. those safe for consumers? I cannot, I don't have uh, all the 
information to say state here in a panel if that's safe or not for consumers uh, it's uh, of course those dependent uh, however those that substance in specific it's being widely used to as a calming substance and as a stress soothing substance and uh, we must not forget the context that we're living we're living here in europe we're living with a, a war uh, by our doorstep but also we're going through a pandemic and this really had a toll on mental health and on stress and i reckon many people have been using cbd to calm themselves down um but i would like to understand how this uh, substance is better regulated i however i cannot state if it's safe for consumptions that will of course depend on the manufacturing process, but also on the dosage. Well, I think let's then go to Dr. Philip Calder then. Um, you might be the best place to answer this question because there is such an explosion of CBD um, you know, available in the marketplace yeah, right now. I, um, in fact, um, I'm sorry to disappoint you, Mariam, but I don't think I have enough information to make um, a sensible comment that goes beyond what Sarah has said, um, which I think was a very uh, well-founded uh, set of comments. Okay, well, let's, before we run out of time, I want to ask a question then. So, you know, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of people, as I was saying earlier, lots of people, um, you know, trying to use supplements as a way to enhance their diet um, and their general uh, well-being. So did the pandemic make us healthier or unhealthier? Was there sort of more of an of, of people wanting to take supplements to feel healthy rather than understanding um, which supplements are best for them at that time? And perhaps, um, Dr. Cold, you could go first. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And actually, I've been asked that question a few times over the last 18 months. So I think um, there was a diversity of responses. So in terms of, you know, did, did the COVID pandemic make us more or less healthy? So if we think about food, um, so there was a lack of accessibility to food because of transport restrictions, shortages. Um, some people lost their jobs. They didn't have the uh, financial uh, 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 sufficiency to get the foods they wanted. Um, there were different demands on time with homeschooling and so on. Um, so there were different priorities in families, maybe. Uh, there was also an increase for a lot of people in sedentary behavior. Um, so I think for a lot of people, um, actually, their health became worse. Uh, there's also the issue of anxiety and mental health issues, which have gone up, which, um, again, Sarah mentioned. I think, on the other hand, there were some people who probably became more healthy because they had more time on their hands. So in the UK, um, you know, fitness classes on TV in the day became very popular and a lot of people started actually, or at least some people started doing more physical activity than before. Um, people had the opportunity to do more home cooking because they were at home. Uh, people took more to growing their own or some people took more to growing their own um, vegetables and things. So they were having fresher food and so on. So again, I think, um, you know, I think there were some people, maybe the majority who, who became less healthy, but there were some, I'm sure, who adopted um, more healthy lifestyles with regard to both their diet and their physical activity, and maybe some other things as well. But I think, you know, one thing that the pandemic also did was make people more aware, perhaps, of the things that they could do that would perhaps, um, you know, make their their diet yeah. um, and their health. So I think, yeah, well. I mean, I think in, in, in the context of our discussion today, I think people became much more interested in, in their diet. And I know, you know, supplement use went up um, because, I mean, others have touched on it because of um, things that we people were hearing, some of which I think actually were well-founded, some of them not, about the importance of nutrition and supporting the immune system, for example. Um, so I think it has been an interesting time uh, in this context of, you know, a challenge that makes uh, situations for people different and some people, um, uh, you know, uh, deal with that positively and some negatively. Yeah. Um, Bernhard, I'll come to you next. Um, there's an audience question from here. 
Yakesh Kulnarni, I apologize if I've actually butchered your name there, um, but he says nutritional supplements are relevant not only in the context of deficiencies, but also during treatment of disease-related malnutrition in addition to standard medical nutrition. But not all patients have access to expert nutritional advice. Shouldn't this be part of the inequality discussion? Oh, if, it, if it's related to, to, to a disease, I, I think... You have to go to the doctor first, and then getting getting then the clear advice of the doc, phys, uh, your, of your doctor, the physical uh, practitioner, uh, about what what you have to do. And it's not like that you can really say, okay, I I am taking this supplement uh, based based on on my own knowledge. So therefore, if it's about a disease, we have to uh, the doctor has to decide what is the the right treatment of the disease, and if a supplementation is helpful to improve the situation, then of course he will uh, uh, order, uh, give you a clear advice on that. Okay, um, and then to another question, uh, perhaps Kelly Atz, you could take this one. Um, it says, some food supplement regime appear to have an impact on mood disorders like depression or anxiety. Perhaps this maybe isn't a question for you, let me know. Um, can you confirm if there are specific mental care providers who use food supplements as a complement for psychological psychiatric care? Um, Kelly Atz, do you want that question or should yeah. I put it to someone else in the panel? I think uh, this question is not for me because, yeah, I don't have the knowledge to answer it. And uh, yeah, maybe some other panelists will want to answer this question. Okay, well, there's, there's perhaps we can leave that one because I think I'm, I'm, I'm not quite sure if, if our panelists can really, you know, have the... Um, understanding to, to actually, you know, give an answer to that one. Um, another question from Mariella Porter, who says, would over-supplementation increase the risk of cancer? Um, who would like to take that one? Perhaps our MEP. I mean, these are sort of, you know, I think what, what we're seeing here in some of these questions, are these are questions that people are asking but because perhaps they're a little bit unaware or not quite sure exactly what supplements are doing um, when, they, yeah. when they sort of ingest them. Yeah. But, but can you repeat the question? I didn't hear the substance. Supplementation increased the risk of cancer. Sorry, I had a break on the microphone. I still failed to hear the substance. Would over-supplementation increase the risk of cancer? Mm -hmm. This is something that over one of our um, viewers... Yeah. I, would, I would give this example. If you drink five liters of water right now, at this stage, you might die. So anything that is uh, too much or too little will have, a, of course, an impact on your overall clinical physiological status that then can go to a pathologic way. Uh, I don't believe we have the tools or the evidence to clearly state that over supplementation will, uh, it's a causality link for cancer, but over supplementation could harm your health, especially as has been widely spoken here today, if it's not um, advised or if it's not followed by a certified health professional with substantiated knowledge in the matter. So really do, you know, understand what you're taking and read the back of the packet. Um, Dr. Philip Calder, I understand that you wanted to uh, comment on um, the comment that we got about mental health. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I, I can actually cover both uh, quickly. So there is a whole area that's called food and mood. And we know um, actually from our own experience that what we eat affects um, affects our mood and our mental well-being. So I, I can't answer the question about whether therapists dealing with mood disorders are using supplements. But certainly many of the things we eat do have effects on, you know, our, our, our brain in uh different ways. So that is an important area. Coming back to the over supplementation question. So one of the issues is we already touched on high doses of single of single micronutrients. They can be harmful. And that's why I think this idea of a balanced mix of, of micronutrients and modest amounts is superior. Um, there are and that's because of interaction. So for example, if you take a high dose of zinc, over time, you can become copper deficient. And that's because zinc stops copper absorption from the gut. So there are these interactions that people are not um, often aware of. Um, there are some human studies showing that um, some supplements actually can have adverse effects in some populations. And um, we don't really understand um, why that happens. 
And so that's an area of research trying to find out if you like the adverse impact of supplements in some subgroups of the population um, who maybe are at risk of a particular disease like cancer, for example, who are pushed more that way with particular supplements. So that is that is a real thing that has been uh, reported in the literature and is a topic of research. Okay, brilliant. Okay, well, we're sort of nearing the end um, of our um, panel discussion. So I'll ask you all now for your final comments. Um, Sarah, Sarah, does me please, please go ahead, please. My final comments is uh, to for uh, as many people that are using food supplements to try to uh, understand what are, they are taking and uh, have a, the guidance of a certified professional from our side and as a politician. Of course, I will try and keep working to advance better regulation for these substances, uh, but uh, it's uh, then up to each one of us to understand what we're taking, if there's questions, uh, to consult a certified health professional in the matter. Okay, brilliant. Uh, Kelly Ants, please go next. Yes, I would just maybe like to emphasize uh, some um, uh, some remarks that I, I already made, but I think that it's very important to uh, revising this legislation. Uh, we need to um, to have the safety first that all the food supplements are safety and i think that monitoring testing and surveillance of products are very important and um, i think that uh, it is relevant uh, that if the parties uh, harmonize the regulatory framework for uh, food supplements so i thank you again for the invitation and it was very fruitful discussion thank you a pleasure indeed uh, dr philip calder yeah, thanks. So I think um, just to reiterate, um, people's diets affect their health and well-being in the short, medium and long term. And therefore, eating a healthy diet is really, really important for people's health. Uh, nevertheless, we've all touched on that uh, even people eating a pretty healthy diet can have gaps in some nutrients. And I think we've all mentioned vitamin D, omega-3 fatty acids would be another. So there are some of uh, some special nutrients where we might want to consider uh, supplementation to make up the gaps. Okay, thank you very much. Then lastly to Bert Harbour then, your final comments, please. Yeah, thank you. Food Supplements Europe would like to see a greater cooperation to help to solve the EU's most pressing health challenges. We would like policy stakeholders and industry organizations to put aside any differences and work together to develop integrated strategies that tackle widespread poor nutrition and increasing healthcare costs. We understand not everybody shares the same views as us, but uh, about the importance of supplementation. However, it is also clear that there is much common ground between us. And we have heard this also to, in this today's debate. The longer we spend debating this topic between ourselves, the less time there is to focus on addressing the real problems at hand. That's why F FSE, Food Supplements Europe, invites anybody with an interest in this area to work with us to find solutions on these issues. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, well, I guess we're going to have to leave it there. But to then to our panelists, um, MEP Sarasaradas, Curly Ads, Dr. Philip Calder and Bert Harbour. Thank you so much, of course, for being part um, of this debate. Um, I think all of you have given anyone and everyone who has been watching um, some really good information um, on the debate surrounding uh, food supplements. Um, I'm Mariam Zadian for myself and the team at Uractive. Take care and bye bye.